So you've been running your infrastructure in the cloud and it's spurred incredible levels of innovation. But now you're blowing past budget forecasts and you're not entirely sure why. The problem is the same model that's empowered your team has pushed procurement to the edges of your organization and the old centralized control methods just aren't working. You need a model that gives your teams a common language, one that gets them communicating so they can manage costs without sacrificing the flexibility and velocity that's the whole point of cloud. To operate at scale in the cloud, something new is required. Welcome to FinOps. FinOps is an operating model that brings financial accountability to variable spend in the cloud. Using FinOps, your tech, finance, and business leadership teams share the same language and processes so they can manage cloud spend while maintaining velocity. The model consists of three distinct phases. The inform phase gives you visibility into cloud costs, for allocation, and for creating shared accountability by showing teams what they're spending and why. The optimize phase empowers your teams to take the right optimization actions based on your goals. And the operate phase refines those shared IT, finance, and business leadership goals to focus and scale your operational efforts through continuous improvement. By breaking down the silos between teams, FinOps improves the unit economics of cloud, so you can increase your usage without increasing your bill. With FinOps, your teams work together to optimize the speed, cost, and quality of your cloud, empowering them to truly rule your cloud spending. Find out more at FinOps.org. Welcome to FinOps X. Introducing J.R. Stormont, Executive Director of the FinOps Foundation. Wow, there are a lot of you here. It's so exciting to see you all in person. You look nothing like your Zooms, or a little bit. Um, thank you for coming. I know a lot of you traveled on Father's Day, on Juneteenth. A lot of you got stuck in places like Toronto and they canceled flights. We have people here from India, people here from France, we have people here from Israel, Canada, all around the world. Um, thank you for making the journey to our first real conference. Uh, the video that you saw was actually from three years ago. It was the launch of the FinOps Foundation in 2019. And I haven't watched the video in probably a year or two, and I went back to it last week and went, huh, most of those concepts are still pretty much the same, right? It's accountability, it's collaboration, it's communication, visibility, all those areas. But what's changed, as you've all seen in the space, and we're gonna see a lot over the next couple of days, is the scope and scale of the FinOps practice uh, and of this community as it grows. So this is our first official conference. Uh, hopefully not the last, hopefully one of many. I might hesitate about Austin in June. It's been a little, little <laughs> humid out there. Not really a shorts guy, but had to wear them yesterday. Uh, this group is kind of amazing uh, to me, and in a lot of ways I hope that this is not like other conferences you've been to, meaning it's not a sales and marketing conference where we're trying to convince you to use more of some widget. This is literally a community event full of community outputs with people here to share their individual best practices and stories not case studies. So you're gonna hear learnings and failures and other things. Uh, the mission of this conference, like the foundation, is to help you individually in your career, in your path, in your progression, so you can take that back to your organizations as well. Now, <laughs> when we started planning this like two and a half months ago, it wasn't very long ago, uh, it was meant to be a small one day event with maybe 200 people we were hoping for. And the response to the community was frankly like, kind of amazing and shocking. We kept upping the size, getting more speakers, and now it's a full two day conference uh, with a separate offsite venue tomorrow because this space was all being used for Open Source Summit. Uh, 85 speakers out of 400 and almost 50 attendees now, which I think is actually really cool because what you've got in this room and at all the talks you're gonna be at, all the networking events, is a high density of thought leadership. People who have been through it, who have real stories to tell. So don't forget, this is about making connections and talking to others and getting to know your peers. So make the effort to do that. Everybody here, everybody in the coffee lines and the lunch lines, even the bathroom lines, is somebody you should probably meet. So important thing on this slide, the color coding. The color coding aligns to the lanyards, mostly. We ran out of speaker lanyards, unfortunately, so apologies to speakers who didn't all get the yellow ones. But let's start with our, our governing board and TAC. Can anybody on one of those two bodies put their hands up, please? Governing board and TAC. Awesome, so great to see so many of you. So these are the folks that make the strategic decisions about the foundation, that help vet the technical best practices and are really the backbone of the organization. Can we have ambassadors please raise your hand in the purple lanyards? Woo! 
new program. I think there's like 17 of you now, maybe 13. Uh, these folks are here to help you as community members. They're all experienced practitioners and they can give you guidance or they can introduce you to people or they'll probably buy you a beer. I'm looking at Eric up here in the front row. Uh, next group is speakers. Can you put your hands up? Awesome. So find these folks. They spent weeks preparing content. We watched all 85 presentations ahead of time. They're great. Uh, and the last group is the staff. Can you do, put your hands up as well, wherever you are. All right. I'm so lucky to get to work with this group of people. Uh, they have been busting their buns for two and a half months to make this happen. Thank you, everybody, for all the effort on this. Uh, we're hoping everybody's going to get a little time off over the summer. So next thing, I want everybody to turn to their left and introduce yourself and tell the person what you're interested in learning about or talking about at this event. I'm not kidding. Go ahead. Okay, time. Boop. Doop. Okay, I got a timer countdown here. Okay, now turn to your right. Turn to your right and do the same thing. Ten seconds, go. <laughs> all right, so our, our goal here is for, for all of you. Our, <laughs> This is working better than I thought it was going to work, actually. I thought it was going to be awkward, and it's not, apparently. <laughs> Whoever said FinOps people are shy? So, sorry. So our, our goal here is for all of you to make connections and head back with an inbox full of LinkedIn requests. Wow, I've lost control of the room. This is amazing. <laughs> OK. This is a slide that will make everybody stop, right? Uh, also want to give you a shout out to our sponsors uh, who made this happen in a bunch of ways. Uh, also. Having worked with marketing teams in the past, when you come to them and give them like six weeks to put together events, uh, it's, it's hard for them. So these folks did an amazing job bringing pulling it all together. Uh, big shout out to our platinum sponsors, Deloitte, Google Cloud, and IBM especially, uh, and to the eight gold sponsors as well. We also have a lot of silver sponsors out there. I hope you go see them. I've been in this space now for 10 years, and one of the things I've noticed is that there's a lot of movement between vendors to practitioners to consultants, back to vendors to clouds. So I'm bringing that up here because don't forget, all of these companies have a lot of thought leadership baked into them, a lot of really smart people in product, in engineering, in services teams, in customer teams. They're also all contributing back to the foundation, honestly, as actively as the practitioner community. So please go talk to all these people. They've got the good things to share. The other thing I found last week was a video clip of the first ever FinOps Foundation member call, which uh, was in 2019. We had a total of 26 people in the foundation at the time, and 14 of those attended this call. At the time, we were doing these calls weekly because we were writing the FinOps book, and we needed content. We needed ideas. Uh, what's really cool is nine of the 14 people on that call are still in the community today. And one of them, Joe Daly, actually works for the foundation. So really exciting to see. More fun, though, now is the size of the summits that they are at this point. So fast forward three years. Uh, you know, we now get, on average, over the last four summits, 1,300 plus people who attend these. Uh, what's interesting about these, again, they're not webinars, right? This is a community output vehicle. We typically feature 10 to 15 speakers that are outputting from six to 10 different working groups who have spent weeks preparing best practices, talks, white papers, all these different areas. Now, what was funny, I don't know if you noticed in the last slide, uh, a lot of the questions people are still trying to answer today, we were talking about in 2019. Why FinOps? Where FinOps? Where does it report? All these things. What's changed is that we now have three years of the community working on enriching materials, implementation guides, the FinOps framework, there's certifications, there's trainings. So you don't have to go it alone anymore. This group has got your back. Uh, and more importantly, they've got the backs of all the people coming in fresh to it. Uh, one example, great example of one of those working groups is the US government working group. Um, there are 12 active agencies participating in this working group, from the Armed Forces to the White House to the Small Business Administration, uh, led by the impeccably dressed Mr. Melvin Brown, who is the Deputy CIO of the Office of Personnel Management. Half the time he's on a bow tie when we have calls with him, he's amazing. Um, but this group has actually taken the FinOps framework basics, as we're encouraging the working groups to do, and they've spun a version for the government that factors in the government's unique requirements, like you need to spend all your money, not less than the money that you, you know, have, or that you could spend. Um, 
But what's really cool is they're aiming toward getting this to be a standard for all these agencies, and they're working toward creating something longer for that. We're looking to do the same thing in other geographies like the UK, Australia, Canada, et cetera. Three years ago as well, when we launched the FinOps Foundation, we did a slide about the rise of, of cloud, really, and I've adjusted this a bit to be the rise of FinOps just to kind of tell the history since then. We all know where we started, fixed cost, the old school way, CapEx, all that jazz. Uh, looking back, we first started seeing the seedlings of this practice originate probably 2012, 2013, uh, usually in the Bay Area, the Adobe's, the Airbnb's, the Atlassian's, uh, who were at that point already spending a bunch on cloud and trying to solve these challenges. Uh, first time we started talking about FinOps, 2016, uh, I had the fortune to be in at the AWS uh, Public Sector Summit in DC and speaking with a guy named Emil Lurch uh, around this topic, and it was the first time we started to talk about FinOps as a concept. 2019, the FinOps book came out. Thank you to all the folks who participated in that. We're working on the second edition right now, so if anybody wants to contribute more, now's the time. Uh, and what's notable here is at that time, in 2019, Gartner said that cloud spend was gonna be, by this year, $360 billion, that's the original number from the slide three years ago. So remember that for a minute. Uh, in 2020, the FinOps Foundation joined the Linux Foundation. Uh, we are a part of LF, the Linux Foundation. We are uh, inherently from them now an open source community, uh, vendor neutral, cloud neutral, uh, focused on helping the community in all the ways we talked about. And today, we're now 7,000 members, which is really cool because in 2020, we were 1,500 when we joined the Linux Foundation. But the really amazing number is if you look at what happened to cloud spend, in the last two years, the actual number was 500 billion. So that's a big number, uh, but you know, Gartner puts out big numbers, so there's a bigger one coming. Um, the current focus on the amount, and the wording here is interesting, the amount of enterprise IT spending at stake to move to cloud by 2025 is 1 1.8 trillion. This is what could possibly go. Notably, that is actually larger than the GDP of Canada. That's how big that number is. Mind blowing. I was hoping that would hit better with the Canadians. <laughs> um, we did run it by three Canadians. They said it was okay, but. <laughs> so, uh, you know, on the back of this, we're seeing uh, the trade, the practice of FinOps accelerate. Uh, the graph on the left is the people on LinkedIn who, in the last two years or three years, have listed uh, FinOps as a skill very much going up, uh, and the important stat is the new jobs happening. There's so many jobs being posted currently in our Slack, online forums, all over the place, hitting on these areas. But not all smooth sailing. We thought 2020 was bad, welcome to 2022. Uh, there's some economic changes afoot, and I've been avoiding logging into my stock market account for all the reasons, uh, but this really underscores the need for FinOps more than anything, right? This practice is now at the center of how do we be more efficient in cloud spend? How do we increase profitability of the businesses, reduce waste? I believe that all of you have chosen a recession-proof business for the next two years because you're gonna be at the center of organizations being sure that they are maximizing the value of their most critical resources, their cloud spend, their engineering time, their dollars, all these areas. And we're also seeing, obviously, sustainability become more and more important in the world. And FinOps and sustainability, although different disciplines have a lot of oversecting components, intersecting components, uh, and we're finding that the sustainability lever is a big one that you can pull in FinOps land to get engineering action and also to get more budgets and focus because of all the uh, corporate mandates that now CEOs are bonused on around sustainability. So we have a few talks happening on sustainability and a panel that I encourage you to check out in the next couple days. And to the point of what was the title uh, of my talk, I just keep seeing FinOps in this whole practice as a parallel to everything that we deal with in life. It is about adapting to change. It's about hitting a challenge, like moving into cloud and overspending and adjusting and fixing and learning new culture. I found out at midnight last night that uh, one of our keynote speakers, who's meant to be re receiving an award, uh, couldn't come. So we've swapped out, we've adapted to change in that. Uh, and I see FinOps in the land of uh, resilience, right? And resilience, in my mind, is when an organization can hit a hard time and it can adapt and improve and get better on the back, as compared to just a stable organization, that when they hit that hard time, they might get through it, but they end up right back where they started. And we believe that if you're not effectively implementing FinOps in a technology business where you're maximizing the value of your cloud spend and all businesses are becoming technology businesses, that there's gonna be a loss of competitive advantage. So increasingly more important as we go forward. 
Adoption of the practice has shifted left in my mind to now be not just the cool tech kids. IDC is saying by the end of next year, 80% of organizations are gonna have a practice of this sort with at least one person dedicated to it. Now that's not that surprising when we figure about 80% of organizations are going to cloud right now. But when we talk to these new organizations coming in because they're now in insurance and financial services and retail and manufacturing, what they're saying to us, we had three of them on a training uh, two weeks ago say, they're now having their uh, account teams at the clouds at the beginning of the migration journey say, you need to start thinking about cost and building the practice and the culture of cloud financial management or FinOps or cloud cost management or whatever you call it. It has become something you do at the beginning, not once you hit the oh crap moment. So this is just a small cross slice of organizations that are involved with the foundation or purchase training or running these practices out there. It is across every major industry and some companies that you would never think of being as advanced as they actually are. Now, conversely, we've seen maturity in FinOps shift way to the right uh, in the last few years in the sense that uh, they've gone from these crawl practices to walk and run. And a great example from our uh, one of the summits recently, uh, Vic Saluja, who's got a, a breakout as well, he's at Cigna. He did a walkthrough of their uh, automated cost allocation reporting system that was all serverless based, that gets data in the path of the engineers at the right time. And he's part of, I think, a one or two person team at an insurance company that is way advanced in this stuff. So we're seeing what used to be walk stage is now crawl and the run stage is now walk and a lot of acceleration there. Now, good news, bad news on here is that as a practitioner or someone who is doing this work, everybody's hiring, you know, you will have no limit, no shortage of jobs in the coming years. Bad news is most of you are also trying to hire and grow your teams. Uh, there is a real lack of uh, enough people out there, not just in direct FinOps roles, but in supporting roles like you know, financial analysts who understand cloud, data engineers, uh, cost engineers, FP&A and finance partners who understand cloud. And so that's really the mission of the FinOps Foundation. And what we're here to do is help fill that gap of people. And we do it through three key areas. Uh, we're here to advance the people who advance, or who, sorry, who manage the value of cloud through community, like this, like the summits, like the podcasts, like the stories, uh, by inspiring growth, which is all about professional development with certifications, with uh, trainings. We're working long-term, ideally, to get these curriculums into, um, they really didn't like to talk, sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> to get these curriculums into colleges and code schools so engineers can start thinking about these concepts earlier and MBAs can understand that from a financial perspective. And the third area is the FinOps framework and the empowering best practices through the working groups through the open source standards that we're talking about. Now I wanted to give an extra special shout out to this set of sponsors because they went above and beyond their normal sponsorship dollars and gave extra money to help us bring in people based on uh, diversity and need. Uh, enabled 20 people from four countries uh, as far away as India to come to this conference who previously weren't uh, able to come. So round of applause for those folks, please. And to the CNCF, our big sister, big brother organization who saved our butts when we decided to go to a second day conference and had a bunch of additional costs that we weren't expecting. Uh, they sponsored the welcome reception last night. They're sponsoring a lot of the day two things like internet, which you all need, which is very expensive. It turns out for 400 people. So thank you to CNCF for that. And I'm only about 30 seconds over time, I think. So with that, let's get to the fun stuff. Um, we are giving away three awards uh, on stage today. And then tonight at the party, which is 6.30 to 9, I believe, we're gonna do six more community awards. So if you wanna be there for the awards, and some of you in the audience are receiving awards, but you don't know it yet, definitely please be there by seven. Uh, this award is probably the most, in my mind, the most important. This is about an individual who exemplifies what we see as an ideal practitioner in the community, somebody who contributes, who gives back. This person has been an informal mentor, is probably gonna be in our future formal mentor program. They've been multiple time speaker, they're an ambassador, uh, they're a frequent contributor to our podcast, they're a champion of all things diversity, equity, inclusion in the organization, they're a working group leader, and the best part, she's a really nice person. Please welcome to the stage, Dina Solis. Dina also had the best walk-on music choice, by the way. She, she chose her own. 
Um, so in addition, uh, Dean is going to join me for a panel uh, on the state of FinOps data. Uh, we're going to be joined by Rakinder from Deloitte uh, and also Ali from Disney. So welcome them out as well, please. <laughs> Dina's award is up there, by the way, but I was told not to hand them back and forth, so we're going to give it to her later. Hello. So this panel was very intentionally designed a mix of all the personas in the foundation. So we've got consultancy, we've got two practitioners, but Ali was also formerly on the AWS Optics team, which worked with a lot of their large customers through this. So excited to get the cross slice of everybody's inputs here. What we're gonna talk about is the state of FinOps data. Some of you have seen some of this on our summits. Uh, this was our second annual survey. Uh, we had about 1,056 respondents. Those people, by the way, gave us almost 30 minutes of their time and represented almost a quarter of the community at the time uh, to cover about $40 billion of cloud spend. That was how much they represented. So overall, the demographics were from large organizations, and this is about that shift left uh, in adoption. We had 40-plus uh, percent were 10,000-person-plus companies, 70-plus percent were over 1,000-person companies, and really represented from all over the globe. So with that, uh, I wanted to get the panelists' input on this. Uh, interestingly, we saw financial services as the top uh, industry represented in the survey respondents, followed by software and technology, no surprise there, and then a long tail of others, healthcare, media, retail. Uh, why don't we start right next to me here with Kinder. Does this align to what you're seeing in the industry, and, and why do you think those ones are on top? Um, yeah, I would say when I took a look at this data, it was not a big surprise that financial services, telecom, uh, media, technology, and healthcare were kind of at the top. Um, I think it goes in line with cloud adoption. I mean, from a Deloitte perspective, those are the industries that we see uh, that are really leading from a, a cloud adoption perspective. So it's not really a big surprise that the survey respondents would represent those industries. Um, yeah, I guess I spent a lot of my time in financial services, and I'm glad to see financial services leading the pack there. <laughs> um, but one of the things to note, I would say there's a story inside each of those bars where even in financial services, there's a pretty, um, pretty high degree of variability around, or maturity, I guess I should say, around where different FI stand around cloud adoption. You've got some that are super mature, and then you've got some that are still trying to kind of dip their toe in the water and figure out how this whole thing works. Awesome. Allie, what have you seen as part of your work previously and where you are? Yeah, definitely. So my old team, Optics, actually worked with some of AWS's largest and most complex customers across all of different industries. When I first started there in 2019, there was about three of us on the team. When I left, there were nearly 30 to 40 of us. I think that's just a clear sign to show how much adoption has grown, but yeah. how much our customers, now myself as a customer, are prioritizing this and making it something that is just a part of our experience. And you've been, Dina, in both tech and retail. What have you seen differences between the two and how the FinOps practices were structured? I'd say, Ellie, that was really well said. <laughs> I'd say from my experiences, seeing that other adoption, it's not unlike what Rakinder mentioned. There's a wide range of uh, the adoption scale. And there are still people figuring it out in each of those sectors. So really, this is, it's a good reflection. It's an aggregate. We can't make too many assumptions about what that says about us individually. And what we also know is that um, there's a ramp to getting very proficient very quickly, and this is one of the starting points. Very true. So let's look at the next data point, which uh, has always been the most interesting to me anyway, uh, about the top challenges. We asked, what are your pain points in your practice? Not surprisingly, this year as last year, um, enabling and getting engineers to take action on cost optimizations was the top challenge. Uh, notable drop this year from last year, share cost and the allocation of share cost dropped considerably. It was the number two challenge last year. It went, I think, all the way down to seven or eight uh, this year. Now, obviously, it depends on maturity, and it's a question of did things change because we have earlier stage people, but you know, Dina, from your take, why do you think it's stacked up this way, and why do you think things like shared cost drop so much? I think both of those are really important. Um, indicators, but maybe not why you would think. Um, the shared cost, because it's, it's a learnable skill and there are applicable tools and a whole bunch of new tools that have flooded into the market and a whole bunch of new knowledge that has been shared about strategies for those. And I think one of the things that we figured out is that there's not just one strategy mm -hmm. for shared cost allocation. 
there's a whole bunch of really good questions to ask to find out which strategy is gonna be best for you. And with the, <laughs> with the engineering question, getting engineers to take action, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> My heart was pounding when I ran up, so yes, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, um, I think that you can substitute the word engineers with any role in your organization. Um, mm. When I talk with groups of engineers, when I talk with groups of analysts, I don't think anyone is um, necessarily saying that, that any role could be solely responsible for being a bottleneck. The question you've got to start asking is, if action is getting friction, take a step back, look at your culture, look at your communication patterns, look at your anti-patterns, and chances are the engineers are really willing to take action, they're really willing to be accountable, and it's very much a, they want consistency of message, consistency of what will be uh, psychologically safe, <laughs> what will be rewarded, and what's actually being incentivized. So take a look at those incentives. Absolutely. What have you seen Ali work for enabling the right decisions to be made? Yeah, definitely. I, I think it's more about how do we better support our engineers. I think in the past, it's been more of an afterthought. It's always been a little bit more reactive. How do we get them the right tools, the right information that they need from the get-go so that it's no longer, hey, you need to lower your cost. It's how can we optimize how you're building your applications, how you're using the various services from the beginning. So rather than thinking about how do we get engineers to take action, how do we, as the folks in this room, better enable our teams to be successful and make the right decisions? Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I love the anti pattern comment, by the way, also. This is very true. Um, Rakinder, so I think you had a good take on this recruit before. Like, how would you group these things together? Um, yeah, like a true consultant, I gotta try and simplify this because there's too many things for me to understand. <laughs> You're not billing um, us right now, are you? No, no, Great, this, okay, is free, this is free advice. Um, <laughs> Take it for what it's worth. If I, was to take, if I was to take a look at this data and try and kind of summarize it a little bit in a way that you could take some action on it, it kind of what stood out to me was that you could really group all these things into three buckets. There's like people issues, uh, there's data issues, so a lot of these kind of, you know, just focus on reporting, aggregation of data, and then there's some stuff in here around tactics, just some things that are hard to do. And so if I was to create a go-forward plan on how to take action on some of these things, I would really try and bucket it around those three categories. Makes sense. So now we're gonna ask all of you to pull out your phones. Uh, the screen should switch in just a minute, I think up there. Uh, and if you can go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. There we go, and at the very top in tiny letters that I can barely see, I hope you can, you're gonna enter the code, which is, ready? 1 now this is a word cloud, which means we need you not to put any bad words in this because there's no like 15 second delay. Uh, but start putting in the words, the actions, the things that you do in your own organizations to encourage and enable action by engineering teams. I see some people looking up, so hopefully the magic should happen soon. Oh, here we go, ooh. What do you think? There's a lot of really great ones in there. See, cost transparency, accountability, data. It all starts at data. Yeah. It really does. Which is funny, that's like the hardest thing in this space, right? In terms of the granularity, the frequency, the allocation of, and then getting it in front of the right people. Mm -hmm. What else is standing out? It keeps moving. Yeah. <laughs> it's harder to see than we expected. So in a lot of ways, I think this represents, we did a working group last year on this very topic, uh, and we got 440 responses of how people did it. Um, wow, a lot of good stuff. We did not test this ahead of time, at least not with 400 people. Um, but what came at us is that, yeah, we see, you know, people needed to first provide visibility, that was kind of the crawl stage, right? Then you get into incentivization with scorecarding, other things, gamification. But then ultimately getting into, I love the accountability point, you know, executive mandates, making sure that uh, cost is baked into sprints, those types of things. Um, Dina, you're coming directly out of engineering world. Like what of this resonates for you? You know, full disclosure, I can't see those words. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but coming out of the engineering world, that, 
I'll, I'll tell you, in my experience and, and in the, the different teams that I've um, worked with, what works for the team depends on uh, what patterns are already established. If you've already got a very high trust culture, a high performing team, chances are gamification is gonna work great. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're gonna get a lot of people uh, incentivizing each other just with social press pressure. Um, and at other times, it's gonna be very much a, a little bit more hand-holding, a little bit more of that, um, that understanding of the whys. And that's, I think I, that's where that, I love that slide from 2019 where you're breaking down the barriers between, mm. <laughs> between silos because that still is happening. And it's actually a thing that you have to do all the time. As engineers roll off and as, as other leaders roll off, cultures change and communication patterns change. You've gotta still be very vigilant about keeping those silos, um, you know, they're, they're specialized and so silos happen, but you've got to keep them connected. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so the silos, I think, are still, main, still one of the hardest problems. And if we can get switched back to the slides also uh, from the crew, thank you. Um, let's talk about the, the team that is hopefully responsible for breaking down those silos. Um, so one of the things we saw in the data was that team size is increasing, right? You saw this slide earlier. Uh, big question I think that always comes up is when do you increase the team size? What is the measure of it? Is it based on cloud spend? Is it based on capability? Uh, Ali, let's start with you on this one. What do you think? Uh, should be the primary drivers of team increase? I'd say there's really no perfect team size, and I think uh, your various teams and the way that their needs change will define what your team size is. So for example, um, at Disney, we have our enterprise organization where we have our team, but we also have our segment teams. And mm -hmm. truthfully, uh, sometimes it might make more sense to have their teams grow versus ours because they're able to be on the ground working with their individual pr uh, product teams to make sure that they're enabling them and giving them the tools that they need, where we're doing it from more of the consolidated level. Yep. And so I think yep. it really varies at the different stages of it, but kind of going back to it, if you don't have the data and you don't have your initial mm -hmm. kind of core team there at that crawl stage, you really can't scale. Well, that's, I mean, really interesting you mentioned that, what I would call the central team, right, versus the, the business units or the external ones. I mean, there is finding that balance of what do you put in that central enablement team, but also not stack that team too large that really you should be enabling the, you know, the spokes rather than just the hub. Rakendra, any thoughts on this before we look at the team structure? Um, I mean, this is not my favorite slide, um, <laughs> and I will tell you why, because it, there's an, so the top around maturity and the bottom, like one doesn't imply the other. Like, I mean, you could have a really mature team of three people, uh, and that could be the right size for a given organization based on you know, how much cloud they're using, the number of hyperscalers involved, yep. number of business units, like all of those things need to be thought about when trying to answer this question of team size. And well, yeah, as consultants, we get asked all the time, what's the, the right team size? Yeah. And the answer is rarely like, here's the number. Well, let's, let's look at some sample. This is a, an actual real world example that was anonymously shared. Uh, nine figure a year cloud spender, uh, been in it for a while. Uh, these are the roles they put out there. Uh, Dina, like, do you see this as the typical makeup? Would you add or remove things from this? Data analysts, data engineers, cost engineers, automation? I think for a lot of teams, it will be aspirational. That's my quick answer. Mm -hmm. and, and that a lot of teams will, that will aspire to this probably shouldn't. Um, because, because of what Rakinder and Ali just said, there is no ideal team size. And what I may think after much analysis and, and data and communication today is a perfect team size for my team is going to change it's going yeah. to change because my business is going to change. So for that reason, I really do think that, that it's important for teams to measure their size and uh, understand how they think it relates to their maturity at that time. But they should also understand how they define maturity. So team yeah. size, not an indicator of maturity. And maturity, not necessarily an indicator of team size. Mm -hmm. they, they, there may be some correlation for an individual benchmark situation, but industry-wide across FinOps practices, it's a, it's a lot it's more to unpack. Place. Well, and in some ways, I also think there can and should be like this bell curve where um, 
you know, initially the team is small, it gets large over time as you're building out reporting practices, evangelizing. Uh, you know, we have some folks here who are building everything themselves, others who are buying platforms. But then the really advanced teams are, are meant to be enabling teams. Ashley Ramako on my team hates when I say this, but uh, like, I don't think the FinOps team should be doing FinOps. They're really about enabling the other teams to do so. And, I think she doesn't like it because it implies they don't do anything, but they have a central function of rate management, right, enablement, visibility, reporting, all these things, but it, it shouldn't be a giant team that owns this over time. Uh, so let's talk about everybody's favorite and least favorite topic, uh, tooling. We intentionally left this really not detailed because we didn't want to get into too many debates. Um, this is all available on the website, though, in a minute we'll show you. Uh, so notable things here, uh, homegrown tooling made a big jump up this year over last year. Uh, native tools continue to be, you know, ahead, not surprising, because everybody uses them. Uh, and, you know, longer tail, a lot of different platforms involved. Um, you know, Rakinder, how about we start with you on this? Where do you see particularly, like, the build versus buy conversation happening right now? Where do you see, you know, people putting together that mix? Because also, 3.7 average tools across the respondents. Yeah, I think my answer there is all of it. Um, <laughs> and, and the reason for that, I mean, many of our you know, tool vendors and partners are out here today, and they, they've heard me say this before. And the way that we look at this from a practice perspective is very much that we want to arm our people with as many tools as possible. So it's very much a, a tool belt conversation. And how many tools do you have in your tool belt versus having one tool and walking around with a hammer trying to solve every problem? Absolutely. Um, there is no right answer, I think, right, with this. It depends. Uh, Ali, I notice uh, AWS Kudos, is that how you said it? Is that, is that what your team worked with there? Or? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep, so the Kudos is part of the Cloud Intelligence Dashboard, and okay. if you guys want to learn more about that, uh, talk to Aaron. No sales hey. pitches. I wasn't meant to be that. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, but I think the most important part about that is, you know, now as myself as a customer, one of the things I notice is, you know, it doesn't really matter what tools you're using. Like what you mentioned, it's your toolkit. But I think it's also how do you bring those together so that you can use them in parallel with each other yeah. to create kind of a streamlined experience. There is no right tool but there are ones that make the most sense for your organization, and how do you maximize your investment? Because tools cost money. Even a homegrown tool costs money. So how do you make sure that your toolkit makes sense for your teams and is always adding value? The, even the homegrown tool costs money thing, I think is really important like to underscore, because I've seen so many organizations go and try and boil the ocean and build all their own stuff, and then they get it there, and then priorities shift and things fall over, and they have to go you know, reassemble things. So it, to me, I, I, I keep seeing it be kind of like a by build and augment sort of you know combination where we're seeing people you know, use a platform for this and use some native tooling here and kind of you know plug it into their tableau or, or anywhere else but yeah I think the the tool belt example is, is a great way to look at that so uh, in 10 seconds each when we come back next year to FinOpsX uh, wherever it may be what do you think is uh, going to be the hot topic that we're talking about from the survey results or otherwise Ali I'd say sustainability being part of the optimization discussions, not as a separate topic. Nice. Rekender? Um, I would say starting to get into cost beyond just IaaS and starting to look at PaaS and, and a more fulsome view of, uh, of IT cost. Getting the spread. Final word, Dina? Oh, gosh. I think that it's going to be an expansion of the community. I think that where we see a lot of folks who may have come out of the ITAM space, um, the software asset management space, I think that there will be a lot more um, convergence and a lot more um, um, transition, evolution. It's like the merging of the disciplines in a lot of way, right? They're coming together. It's not a competition. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a race. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, race to the top. Well, thank you panelists so much for your time and feedback and everything. We'll see you soon. Uh, also, excited to announce that as of like 10 minutes before this started, finally, data.finops.org is live with the new 2022 data. Uh, so please go check that out. It's very pretty. Uh, shout out to Steve Trask and our team uh, and Tom Sharp, uh, who did all the graphics and visuals. Uh, it's a really, really beautiful report. It's not a boring PDF. It's interactive and lovely. Uh, it also digs into a lot of the more details, including things like tool breakdowns, team salaries, uh, other challenges and containers and more. So check that out. And if you want to hear more from Dina, uh, who has a lot of good insights to share, we definitely recommend you check out the FinOps podcast. She has an episode on there. She's also one of the co-hosts of that. If you're feeling really brave and you might want to get on the podcast, uh, 
They are gonna be recording tomorrow, 10, 15 to 12 p.m. Uh, at the Speakeasy venue. And I believe Steph Gooch from the Keys to AWS Optimization is also gonna be there recording. So you might even get on her podcast as well, or her Twitch, sorry. You're cooler than we are. <laughs> uh, another reminder for me to calm myself. Am I talking too fast? Can you understand me? Okay. I, I pride myself on fast, but you know, crisp, hopefully. So with that, uh, we're gonna get into the second award, and uh, this is for a partner who exemplifies how we want, particularly vendors, to plug into the community. It's a very delicate dance. We don't want sales pitches, we don't want marketing collateral. We want them to come and give back, contribute. So this particular vendor has done, I think, the right mix of people involved. They plugged in product leadership, they plugged in billing uh, engineering leadership, they plugged in services teams who are helping their customers with cost and FinOps and all these areas. They participated in our TAC, in working groups. Um, they've also been really great about doing what open source is all about, taking the open source standards that we have, iterating on, on them and adding more to them and pushing them out to support the larger community. Uh, also, I found that they've been very approachable uh, and generally engaged the community and, you know, focus on showing that this area is very important to their customers. So with that, uh, we'd like to offer this uh, first time award to our partner, Google Cloud. This is Amitai in product there. Uh, he's gonna give you a talk in just a minute, but uh, Amitai was not meant to receive this award nor do the talk. He found out at uh, midnight. We worked on it this morning at like 7 a.m., so thank you, Amitai, for jumping in. Yeah, absolutely. He even asked if I should go get him a collared shirt, and I was right. like, no, man, like you look I, great. I, you know, <laughs> this is the dress code yeah. here, right? Yeah. It is, so also uh, shout out to a few people on the slide. Uh, Buna on the engineering team, who is in our governing board, Eric Lam, uh, Patik, and Kinjal, who are in services there, all been great participants in the community, so thank you, all of you. Your war is here, I'll give it to you at the end, and we're looking forward to hearing the talk that Chandu, your <laughs> VP of engineering, was meant to give. Yeah, absolutely, so I might not be holding this while I give this talk. Yeah, thank you again also to my colleagues, Abuna, Eric, Pathak, and everyone has been engaged. A little bit of backstory, um, you know, about two and a half years ago as we started engaging, there was one of the leaders in our org who was really involved in FinOps and was kind of knocking down those virtual hallways at the time because COVID just hit and was trying to explain what this foundation is going to be and how much Google should be involved. And it wasn't a money issue because you might have heard we have a search engine and some ads, you know, so it wasn't the money, but it was like, really, is this interesting? Is FinOps a thing? And we kind of set some goals and we were talking about it. And I got to say, after two, two and a half years, we've definitely exceeded a lot of the things that we were really looking to kind of get from this community and work with this community. Um, so thank you for everyone also in this crowd here of the practitioners and being part of the community. Um, so, you know, I wanted to start off and talk about a little bit how we approach outbound, how we think about FinOps when we engage as you know, a cloud provider. And we look at frameworks, principles, and community. Around the you know, operational frameworks, it's really about what everyone just before talked about. How do we bring business? How do we bring finance? How do we bring engineering and technology all together for that accountability, transparency, and then realizing the business value, right? Because at the end of the day, what each and every one of you want to do is realize your own business's value. You're not, you know, you're not here for some altruistic reason. And then we combine that with principles, the seven principles that we have internally at Google, in Google Cloud, and refined within the FinOps community. And one of them was around blameless, blamelessness culture. And those of you that have been on like some of the uh, monthly meetings may have heard us talk about it about a year ago and kind of how internally at Google, we really like to not look for, hey, you know, Bob or Alice are, you know, to blame, but what can we learn about this? What can we take? And we think that's something very critical for FinOps in general and for each and every one of you. The other one um, is about agility, right? We personally at Google, we've been digital native, cloud native over two decades. Some of you have grown from more traditional industries. And so you have to balance no matter what that kind of like working fast, but also thinking about scaling it, right? How do you take something small and you scale it without the runaway cost? Um, and so the third part is where we engage with you, right? With community. And the FinOps Foundation obviously is, is a big one, but it's also about kind of blogging and white papers and 
and understanding how do we build a practice and how do we build standards out of what we're doing so that we can actually grow at a non-linear pace of spend. And that brings me to this slide, which if I were to ask you to raise your hands, I bet there would be very few people in this room that haven't seen these numbers a million times, including today. But it just talks about that skill of where we are with cloud. Whether you as practitioners look within your own org, even if you do nothing, your groups are gonna be spending more and a lot more. And in general, this industry is growing, right? If we look at a cloud provider, we probably don't have to do a lot and we'll still grow in, in you know, actual numbers. But together with that, you couple it with over 30% of wasted spend. And it doesn't matter which analyst you read or what latest survey, those numbers are similar, right? That kind of non-optimized numbers are humongous and they keep growing in actual spend because of that. Let's couple it with four out of five CIOs talking about how they need to iterate through business value realization, right? And so we see that there's a lot of tough problems for our space. This is where, you know, I, I really appreciate what JR was saying, but we believe we need to solve this together with our customers, you practitioners, our customers, obviously, but the community in large, um, because we can't go at it alone. The first pillar is financial accountability. That means that everyone needs to have the data, not just the tools, tools are important, but the data and then the processes and the governance to really enable the organizations for that kind of accountability across, again, business, finance, technology groups. Internally, our own organization actually has all of that, right? We're kind of, we're all sitting together, finance, product, engineering. And so it helps us sometimes kind of understand the work that other teams have to do. The other is creating sustainable business value. And I think the key word here for me, at least personally, is the sustainable. Uh, we worked with Sky Group a while back. They realized about $3 million in, in savings with Google Cloud, but that's a one-time thing, right? That's a drop. The whole point is that you really have to build these best practices and ownership to continuously iterate on that because it's just like a, you know, a leaky faucet and unfortunately, I'll be realistic, it's gonna continue leaking and you just have to keep finding those and plugging that, you know, those little holes and the whack-a-mole sustainably. You can't fire drill everything out. And then there's the accelerating value realization, right? We worked with Etsy to move some uh, of their spend towards these committed use discounts. They saved 42%. That's great, but that's just one story. It's all about the automation, the intelligence, building into your processes that I talked about before, right? Your toolings, whether it's the cloud native toolings that you're using the console from your cloud provider, whether it's using ISV tooling, or whether it's just getting the raw data out and building your own dashboards like we hear, right? All of those together. There's no one size fits all. And actually one of the great white papers that I think are great that one of my colleagues, Eric Lamb here wrote, right, was about the how to measure the five key KPIs. And what he did there in a very cloud agnostic way is talking about, well, how do you know you're doing the right thing? How do you know you're you know, really realizing what you wanna know? You have to measure. It's not about, do I realize every single recommendation that my cloud provider or someone gave me? Is, am I actually attacking the right ones? And do I know, am I running? Am I walking? Am I crawling? It's okay not to be running. Actually, you know, the moment you're running, you're probably resetting yourself back, in, back to some kind of crawl situation because you need to now, you know, think about that again. Kind of a final note that I want to leave is, okay, I, you know, I'm Google, I spoke here for Google about the products that we're creating, but we're also a big company of our own, right? We have the same challenges that you're having with our own infrastructure, right? How do we balance the money we're spending with velocity? A lot of times you'll hear Googlers talk about, you know, Google speed, right? We want to run. We've got hundreds of engineers that are just vying in our organization to create new products and new platforms at the same time. Well, we have cloud costs. And then one of the ways that we do that is by setting very clear metrics and goals and then giving our different departments the autonomy on the budget, right? So now they can do whatever they want with that 
budget or almost what they want with those resources, human resources, money for cloud, but we're measured. And we keep iteratively looking at that and figuring out, you know, what went well, what went wrong. And again, if I couple that with one of our principles of blamelessness, it's not about someone spinning up a VM they shouldn't have. It's about, okay, what can we learn? What did we miss? What are in our governance or compliance is missing? What should we do? And then leaving enough kind of space and time for us to address those and then iterate again, bring that into our OKR process, right? The objective key results process and learning from that. Um, so, you know, bringing those kind of uh, things there and then the practices um, and evangelizing them within the organization. Um, you know, I've always heard you gotta leave some kind of uh, call to action at the end of all these talks. So my call to action is obviously, we've got about 10 folks or so across, like JR said, engineering, uh, services, product around billing and finance and all that. So please come engage with us. We've got plenty of talks tomorrow. I'm not gonna choose my favorite talk, but FinOps culture definitely is one that I'm gonna be at. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Hey, I need to click it from you. And also, just the fact that he walked on and did this with almost no sleep and no practice is amazing. So thank you, Amitai, for being a great part of the yeah, community. Thank you. Yeah. You're great. So we talked about the three areas we focus on uh, in the community earlier. I want to touch on a couple things in that middle one, inspiring gross, <laughs> gross, growth, which is all about professional development. Uh, on learn.finops.org, uh, definitely encourage you to consider getting certified if you're not. Uh, all the certified folks should have a little sticker on their badge. Um, this is a big part of how the foundation funds the activities it does for the community. So not only does it look good on your LinkedIn, it enables more goodness in this community. So please consider that. We also have a lot of uh, upcoming additional modules that are coming, persona-based trainings, uh, additional uh, depth around certifications for engineers and others. Uh, and we now have 2,500 people certified, which is a, a fantastic growth this year. Um, if you can't afford to buy certification or you know someone who can't, uh, or if uh, you are you know, somebody who can help us increase the diversity of the community, if you're a student who wants to get involved or you know any of these folks, we please encourage you to consider uh, applying for our scholarship fund. Uh, we've given away about $15,000 so far of this 100 grand, so there's a lot more to go this year. Uh, we want to give it all out before the end of the year uh, and get more and more people in the community. We also have an enterprise program that we launched earlier this year that is all about helping the sets, the teams of individuals in the organizations come together to build their own communities, to increase the talent pool, to help them upscale their talent, et cetera. Uh, so excited to announce these two companies that literally I think just last week both joined the program, uh, JP Morgan Chase and Company and Fidelity Investments. You're gonna be hearing a lot more from them later on the FinServe panel. Uh, and wanted to uh, welcome our next set of panelists. Apple was actually the first uh, company to officially join that FinOps or Enterprise program. Uh, little company that you may have heard of. They probably, I'm guessing, have a lot of cloud spin given what they do. Uh, so we're gonna be joined by William Bryant and Benjamin Coles from there, uh, and our very own Ashley Romatko, uh, who has a long, I think, three-year history now with the foundation. She was on the original board, then she was on the tech, and uh, all the while she was uh, head of FinOps at Pearson driving their large practice. Uh, is gonna be emceeing and asking them about the experience there. So welcome them to the stage. I'm so excited to be here, and it's just absolutely wonderful to see all the consultants, the practitioners, and the vendors here. Um, I'm nervous, though, like in a different way. Prior to this, I was nervous because I was a speaker at a lot of these events, and this time, like, I just wanted to be like the best event for all of you. Um, and the reason for that is because I was a practitioner, um, managing a team, pretty large team, up until a couple months ago, and really four years ago, I was the person doing the bill, buying the reservations, um, forecasting in a spreadsheet. And so I've been there. I know what you guys have gone through. And I volunteered with the foundation because I didn't know what FinOps was four years ago. Um, I read an article, found the word, and I instantly went to Google and I was like, that's what I'm doing. I need to find people mm -hmm. that do that. And I found the FinOps Foundation website. It had probably been only launched like 30 days. And I went up to the top corner and I said, join. Was like, hopefully they let me join this thing, um, and they did. And ever since then, JR's like, hey, can you be on our governing board? Can you be on our TAC? Can you launch a working group? And pretty much everything he's asked me to do sounded exciting, so I did it. Um, a couple months ago, he said, we're gonna launch this new enterprise 
membership program. Will you help come launch it? And for me, it felt kind of coming full circle, right? I joined the Finance Foundation as an individual. I came here for help. I didn't want to feel so alone. And so to be able to sit with you guys and other enterprises and help you guys accelerate your journey um, and be part of that, like I'm really excited for that next chapter the Foundation's doing. So enough about me. Let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about Apple. Um, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about what your, um, your roles are at Apple? What do you do? Yeah, so I lead a, an engineering team over in a finance organization. I've been there for about 10 years, and uh, the, I first started off there doing SRA and DevOps. Uh, it's really interesting and fascinating, but you know, in the last three years, it's been primarily focused on doing the, the engineering bit and bringing tools like, uh, what is it, for cost optimization and a little bit about understanding forecasting, which is helping people like William Bryant right here. Yep. Hi everyone, I'm Will. I've uh, been at Apple for just under two years now. Um, I'm in a finance organization, so I manage all of the uh, forecasting, chargebacks, and budget management, um, things like that, and cost modeling. So. I love it. I always get excited when they say, I'm in the finance org. I'm like, <laughs> yay! <laughs> um, so set the stage to the audience. Where is Apple on your cloud journey, your uh, digital transformation? What are you guys doing, Benjamin? So, so obviously, Apple is a very large company, and so we have different uh, stages of the the crawl, walk, and run. And for some of the stages, you know, like some of the groups are just starting out, and we have cloud engineering groups that kind of help people onboard quicker. Uh, but what's really interesting is for some of those run groups, it's it's really cool because they've developed some tools and they're able to move really quickly. Uh, so, yeah, we're all over the place, but you know, we're making progress. Yeah. I like that too. That like you have some other, some different organizations that are like in different crawl, walk, run stages, and that they can actually like learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you're creating your own community to upskill within your organization. That's just amazing. Um, so we talk a lot about FinOps. You know, uh, when you're trying to do FinOps, you have to create an adoption roadmap. What are you going to do in the first 30, 60 days? Oftentimes, you have to uh, pitch what FinOps is to executives. That also means um, they have to know what it is. So like, how did that journey go for you? Um, and like, how did you get the executive team to buy in? Uh, so, you know, you kind of rewind a little bit, right? You have to understand, you know, like kind of the, the journey into using the cloud. Uh, initially, you know, everybody says, hey, we're going to open the floodgates, and everybody jumps to the cloud, and we have a lot of developer velocity that happens. Uh, but when we started taking that back and looking at the, the finance spending, we started saying, wait, there's also this other bit of losing control of the spending. And so we wanted to go back and, and meet with teams and see, you know, what would be the right thing to do. Uh, when we started asking questions, we started to ascertain that, you know, like there's, uh, like more questions lead to more questions, right? We got reporting, and then we get led to efficiency. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered was it was a, a little bit of both, right? Developers were able to move a lot quicker, but at the same time, spending needed to be curbed. What I, I really enjoyed about, you know, the FinOps community and just bringing this all together is, is that, you know, people were having the same kind of struggles. So when we started bringing that into the company, right, like it, it became very apparent that, hey, we, can, we have like this bridge. And so we pitched it to our executives like we needed to have a partnership. Um, you know, the, the partnership idea went very well, right, with the finance, engineering, and leadership teams that, you know, was given a green lit. That's awesome. Um, being, Apple being a tech company, like how does the FinOps practice support your mission to bring the best user experience to customers through innovation of hardware, software, and services? William, you want to take this one? Yeah. So I think for, um, for us, FinOps allows us to be more, how can I put this, make smarter, more informed decisions um, when it comes to our managing our cloud spend. And because we're being smarter and, more, and making those and better decisions, it allows our engineers to you know, continue pushing those creative boundaries and just overall improving the, the products and services that we love and rely on um, every day. So I think that's, that's, that's pretty much how we're handling that. I love that. I know when I had my FedOps practice, we always talked about we were stewardships of the cloud, mm -hmm. um, but we never wanted to be disruptive. Yeah. We never wanted to have something go, an application go down because we needed to right size in the middle of the day. So mm -hmm. I think always being conscious of that, and I'm sure having a very strong engineering culture, that's important to you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> And the, the difference now is that they're still building those services. They're just thinking about it in a more efficient manner, or that's thinking amazing. about trying to build them in a more efficient manner. I love so, that's yeah. amazing. So I'm always curious about what everyone's capabilities that they're focused on right now, what they're working on, and where, where is that maturity stage at and those capabilities that you're, you're really thinking about day to day? Uh, for us right now, I would say our main focus is, our main focus is on uh, cost allocation, forecasting and budget management. 
Um, for cost allocation, we're probably in the final phase, final stage of the walk phase. Um, we're currently partnering with all the different business teams and just establishing and hierarchies, um, establishing hierarchies that makes more sense for them from, from a reporting standpoint, showing back costs, uh, allocating those charges and things like that. From a forecasting and budget management, we're in the early phases. Um, we recently, probably as the last few quarters, established a monthly cadence with the, each team, right? Well, probably each org. Mm -hmm. And within those orgs and those monthly cadences, we discuss, you know, forecasting, their actuals, um, managing the budget and things like that. So we're um, in the early phases of that. When you're developing these things, are you getting a lot of your feedback from the engineers on what you build next? Oh, absolutely. That's good. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. So a little uh, later on, we're going to have the financial companies come out. Um, but I'm always fascinated, Apple being an engineering company. Um, we talk all the time about trying to get engineers to take action. So Benjamin, um, do you feel like being an engineering company, that's helped, hindered you? And in what ways has it helped? So yes and no. Right? I, I think that um, you know, from the perspective, you know, we're able to talk a little bit of the same language. Right? But when working with other engineers, right, we run into uh, like hurdles. Like you know, when we try to ask them to save money or optimize for efficiency, they end up you know stumbling over it a little bit. So there is that little bit of a language barrier in trying to help uh, each other understand where we're trying to go. Um, so the, the thing that's really cool, though, is you know we have the FinOps community, and we can definitely link out to the community and say, hey, you know, people outside the company are doing this too, and then infer that internally, and then people say, okay, you know, if somebody else has done this in practice. You know, that, that's really helpful, right? Because we're all a community trying to learn. I love that. Um, the FinOps framework has been a tool set um, that, you know, uh, we use to judge where our maturity is. And it's kind of fun because being a part of the FinOps staff, uh, we debate a lot about things. JR just mentioned something that I don't agree with him about. Uh, and so that's been kind of fun. I'm curious about you guys as you're trying to, like, roll out the FinOps framework. Like, have you had disagreements or things that you don't necessarily see eye to eye on? You want to go first? <laughs> Should we debate it now? Oh, no, no, we'll definitely <laughs> debate it right now. I, I, I think that, you know, that I'm more of the optimist, right? Like, I think that, you know, we are making strides in the space, right? Um, but obviously, Apple being a, a much larger company, right, there's, it's like that same thing I mentioned earlier, where we're just different phases, right? I like to say that we're a lot further along, and I know that <laughs> William would disagree. I, um, I, like, I, don't, I don't like to say that I'm a pessimist. I just, um, how can I put this? Show me, right? Um, but I do think we're, we're definitely making strides. I just kind of wish those strides would be a lot quicker. I always appreciate that, though. I feel yeah. like I'd have an idea, and then I'd get someone to debate with me mm -hmm. a little about my team and kind of question me. And I love that, because like, it kind of level sets you, yeah. too. So that's great. So um, what advice would you give uh, to a FinOps driver trying to start out and build a team and a practice in the organization? William, you want to take that? Yeah, I'll take that one. So I would say just, you know, be patient, right? The first couple months are going to be uh, like drinking from a fire hose. You know, just kind of hold on and learn and absorb as much as you can. Eventually, things will start clicking, and you know, the things that you learn from the foundation, um, those practices, you'll start noticing them in your day-to-day -day lives, right? In the business. Um, after that, I think you probably should definitely leverage the community. There's a lot of shared knowledge out there, and it's invaluable. So if, learn. Learn as much as you can, leverage the community, and um, build a solid team around you. Try to build a diverse team. When I say diverse, don't try to you know, put people on your team that think like you do. Bring people that, you know, put people on your team that have different perspectives and that are gonna look at problems from a different angle. So that's, that would be my advice. I love that. Every time I, um, sometimes I teach the practitioner course and, or I sit in on it, and every time I take it, I learn something new from that yeah. course. And that's what I think is so amazing is, to keep, you can go relook at the framework, you can go relook at yeah. a white paper, and a light bulb will go off. So continue to be a learner, always. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I have to ask, you know, are you hiring? Hiring anytime soon? Uh, <laughs> actually, yes. Yeah. So um, just brought, brought a person onto the team that starts in a couple of weeks, um, and we have a rec coming probably sometime within the next quarter, probably maybe towards the end of the next quarter. Um, so yeah, just. Go to the Apple Jobs career site and just be on the lookout. That's awesome. Yeah. 
I do want to thank you guys. I know, especially Benjamin, we've been slacking back and forth. I'm like, what do you think about this? And you always give great feedback. So I'm really excited about this partnership and, and see how we can continue to help other enterprises adapt quickly. Yeah. So appreciate cool. everything. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Okay. Got the clicker? No, no, I have the clicker. Okay. All right. Yeah, out that way. Thanks, Thanks Sean. Good to see you. Excellent. So really cool to see uh, that doing, being done at that scale. Um, want to remind all of you, it's hot and humid, so don't forget to take care of yourselves here. We've got a long couple days ahead of us, drink water, all those things. And we also are happy to announce that the Jobs Board is now officially live, also as of a few hours ago. Uh, so this is going to be, oh, thank you. Uh, this is going to be a collection of uh, industry FinOps jobs. The idea is all the jobs in one place. Uh, we're seeding it with a bunch of jobs. If you have some, you want to submit them, there's a form on there. Uh, please definitely consider putting them there as a central landing place for that. So our next speakers are going to talk about uh, automation on the journey to FinOps maturity uh, and the path that they have taken. So uh, Alex Costa, who is program director and running FinOps at Pros, which is one of the larger public companies that I hadn't heard about before uh, on quite the journey. And then AJ Nish, uh, who is head of product at Turbonomic uh, from IBM. Please welcome them to the stage. Get a click. And I think it's up there. We need the click up here. Um, we'll make our way through the slides. I'm sure someone will. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, there we go. Cool. Good All morning, right. everyone. So, hi, everyone. Uh, really excited to be talking to you. So, uh, really, we're here today to talk about Alex and his team's journey uh, within Pros. So, Alex, if you want to give us a quick intro, you know, what is your team? What sure. is Pros? Yes, yeah, so Pro is a software company. We are in the software space as a SaaS company, uh, subscription-based model today. We um, do pricing and we help companies sell in any platform out there. So we pretty much do um, AI, machine learning around pricing for travel, B2B, and all different spaces. I mean, which is pretty much helping companies price and sell their products in any e-commerce platform or even on a, uh, on a physical manner using configured pricing code and some other solutions. So that's what we do. Great. Yeah. And so obviously over the last couple of years, you've been investing more heavily in cloud, developing your cloud strategy, your FinOps strategy. What are your goals? What are you trying to get to? What is your, the outcome that so your let's, team's looking So let's go back a little bit, right? As I said, we are a software company. Um, we were in that model, a subscription, well, a perpetual license selling model, right? So you sell a license, somebody installed that on their server at their location on-prem, and you are charging maintenance on that, right? The company moved from that to a subscription-based model, and as part of that, we moved to the cloud, right? Of course, we had our private cloud, and we went to public cloud at the same time. Now, there are a couple of things that we were trying to do at that time. One was to make sure our product was working on the cloud, right? So coming from a, a server-based server type of deployment to a more microservice uh, type of deployment where you have a multi-tenancy and all that, trying to optimize that. So our, engineer, our engineers were focused on that. And um, of course, as we did that, we tried to develop tools internally to make sure that we are uh, maintaining costs under control. But that was very decentralized initially, right? Every engineer team kind of had their own methodology or tools or access to different types of information to be able to manage uh, spending on cloud. Uh, but of course, also those engineer teams and development teams were more focused on moving the, the product that we have from uh, that old architecture to a multi-service architecture. So it was two kind of, um, I would say, conflicting things that were trying to be done at the same time, right? You're trying to make sure that your product can reside in the cloud and be efficient from a performance-based standpoint. And at the same time, you're trying to make sure that you, that doesn't cost you so much. Uh, but yeah, that was the beginning of the journey for us. Right, and we just saw that in the uh, Google presentation a few minutes ago of, you know, how do you balance speed of innovation with the amount that you have to spend to run your cloud organization? What role does automation play in that for you and your organization? So for us, um, as I said, I mean, software company, uh, I think a lot of people can relate. You try to develop everything internally, right? All controls in the beginning. Uh, and uh, it, it became difficult in a way that we were doing a good job of that, 
but it became difficult in a way that you have so many changes in the architecture of the product. Uh, you are adopting multiple different services. We are an Azure shop. Uh, we are one of the top spenders of Azure in, in, the, in Texas, actually. Uh, so all that, and the teams are adopting new technology in Azure. So it becomes a little bit difficult to manage your internal tools when the engineer teams have to focus on developing the solution and using the new technology that's available. So for us, was identifying that we need to partner with someone uh, to be able to be more efficient. Um, at that time, we, we partnered with Turbonomic. We did, uh, we review a few solutions and we decided Turbonomic was a solution that fit better for us at the time, uh, and it still is. We, we worked through, um, the first thing we tried to, to actually tackle was to use and leverage reservations in Azure uh, to reduce our costs. It was a low hanging fruit for us. Uh, we already had about 40% of our VM deployment in Azure reserved, and we went to, today we are about 85% reserved. We maintain, utilization was about 96%, we are 99% today, but you know, it was our first step, right? Our first step was trying to take advantage, uh, advantage of reservations. From an autom from automation standpoint, we're starting to look at the recommendations from the tool that we, we decide to use. And as you all know, uh, engineers will be risk adverse. They will say, we're not downsizing this, we're not changing things. So there was a lot of uh, getting those those indications, those recommendations, and running through our other tools that we had that we use from monitoring standpoint, from other things, to see if those, kept, if those recommendations were applicable. Uh, of course, because we are in a multi-tenancy type of approach and multi-tenant type of deployment, uh, when you do a change here, it may impact different products across uh, that we have. So there was a lot of that working with engineers uh, having them have this visibility into the data, into the recommendations, and testing in dev environments, in test environments, to see how the performance would be impacted before we got to automation, right? Before automating anything, we had to sell and, and really uh, gain the trust of our engineering teams, and the way to do that was to provide them the data and to provide them the indicators and test, pretty much test what we were seeing from a recommendation standpoint, how applicable it was, and making sure that they had the trust that the tool was recommending something that was applicable. Right, trust I think is key, mm -hmm. you know, and if you could, um, when you talk to your organization, do different players feel differently about performance versus cost? You know, how do you get pressure on different sides, especially as you move through this maturity journey of automating? You know, you wanna to get to a place where you know, you don't need to think about it. You're the system, the process that you have just automatically keeps everything at the exact level that you need to continue to support your business so that your business can continue to grow. But, you know, it's very hard to get everyone to buy in and trust yes. uh, that level of automation, that much, you know, relinquishing control to an automated process. Uh, what sort of pressures do you feel there? Yeah, I think for us, right, being a software company, Every microservice uh, is a little bit different. So you know, if you if you you have you may be v, you may have VMs that are being leveraged and multi-tenant type of stuff that have specific code embedded within the VM from a CPU utilization and memory utilization standpoint. So the people that are responsible for that may be much much more averse to make automated changes because it will say, hey, my script is not going to work or my, in, in, you know, my specific app, uh, uh, specific app uh, settings are not going to work because those need to be changed at the, at the application layer level. Where others, if you have a specific, a change of a SKU, may not impact as much. So we really uh, was working with individual teams in understanding uh, what are the requirements to automate those changes. Um, we had to go through a process that was like, okay, now let's, how can we do the first step of getting these changes or these recommendations into a change management process, right? Where things are really coming and being visible to the engineers before any change is implemented. Uh, so it's, it's about talking with each team and understanding what the concerns are. Uh, of course, we had teams that jump into that 
really quickly and said, yes, we want to do this. We want to automate these things because those change uh, require no downtime. So it's, you know, it's an easy change. Storage is one example, right? Moving tiers. Uh, in that same thing, that's not going to shut anything down. When you talk about changing the skew of a VM, is a whole different story. Depend and in, you might add a, a, that additional layer of complication that I said that you say there's app specific memory settings or CPU settings that need to be changed. So it's really about working with each individual team and understanding their requirements and being able to um, come with the data and help them implement uh, a solution that helps with those requirements or that tend those requirements. So just to play back a little bit of what I heard, you know, as you're trying to get through this journey of adopting FinOps, getting people to understand what they're spending, how they're spending, how that relates to the work that they're doing, all the way to the end of automating the decisions around FinOps, what I heard is a critical piece to that is deep understanding of the actual applications and what they need to perform. You know, if people only care about, you know, keeping costs under control, they can scale everything down. They can, you know, turn everything to, you know, T2 micros and say, hey, you save money, everything's great. Uh, then the business collapses and you don't have a job. Yeah. So would you say, like, how would you rank, um, you know, visibility and understanding relative to application data driving automation? So I think uh, if I have to rank, I mean, visibility and understanding comes uh, Really first, yeah. you know, in a way that it's about not turning things on, right? You can you can all set budgets by subscription in Azure and say once you spend this much, everything shuts off. So you'll be able to hit your target if you do that, but your business is not going to work, right? So it's uh, it's about understanding and have visibility into that and making sure that the teams understand what you're trying to accomplish, right? There's a lot of conversation there, uh, and what help will help us is that as we progress with that, our leadership saw the value they were bringing in, and they help us with other things, right? They help us uh, uh, motivating teams in different ways to be able to have them engage the FinOps practice, right? So it's about, but it's about education at the end of the day. I mean, I think a tool will help you a lot, and Turbonomic has helped us a lot get there, uh, but it's if you don't, as I said, if you don't have, if you're not working close to teams to understand what their struggles are, what their concerns are, it's really hard to get to this next step. Cool. And so we're uh, up for time here, but just one last statement on what's next. You know, if you could pick one thing to move to next in uh, this space, you know, a discussion we're having around aligning to applications, aligning to application performance, application data, you know, how would you feel if we shifted to look more at how much am I spending per transaction? How much am I spending per serving each customer versus how much am I spending on this cloud instance versus that cloud instance? I think you hit the, the nail on the head, right? As, we, as a SaaS provider, what we want to look at is, is our margins and how much money we're making for each specific deployment. Uh, there is a path to get there. And I'm in a microservice and multi-tenant deployment, that's really hard. Right, you all know that. So now we are working closer to people that are working on margins and some other solutions to make sure that we are aligned. So that's our next step, right? We will work more towards the data that we have today and how we can uh, define cost per application, per customer, uh, per group. And we have done some work around that already, so we are moving into that. Um, but yeah, that's what we're working next. Cool, great. And with that, oh, I don't know if I should. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, great. Thank you. Yeah, I love hearing so much about business data and margins and getting unit economics. Always a, a great topic there. Uh, with that, we're going to give our third award, a uh, third of these very pretty awards that you'll see at the party tonight up, up closer. They each weigh about 12 pounds. Uh, this one is a team award that is specifically for an organization that has a mix of people there working across lots of different ways uh, to contribute internally to drive forward their practice. Uh, this particular team has a hub and spoke model. So what's great about this team, we've seen them in the foundation for years now, uh, they have a very sophisticated central group that is pushing out the best practices, managing, rate, managing rates, all those areas. Uh, but they've also got a number of business units uh, who are also quite mature uh, and thought leaders in their own rights, uh, contributing back to the community. A uh, lot of certification in this organization uh, and active contributors to multiple working groups on the governing board, tax summits, been on podcasts, all the things. So very excited to uh, announce that this award for Outstanding FinOps Team goes to Fidelity Investments. So please welcome Jen and Zach.
So Jen is the chairperson of our governing board, uh, and Zach has just also joined the governing board, has finally joined. Uh, so we're also gonna welcome back out with them a few other folks uh, to do a panel on FinServe uh, in, sorry, FinOps in the financial services industry. So please also welcome Andrew Fegg from JP Morgan Chase and Bruno Schaefer from NewBank. Welcome. This is great to be back after three years away. Um, I, I've got to say we were at the CloudyCon um, three years ago, and so it's wonderful to see you all again. You know, we heard from the state of FinOps that um, financial services is actually the largest adopter of FinOps. And so this is a great opportunity for us to learn from some of the financial services. Financial services has some unique challenges um, in their environment when they're adopting cloud. Um, first of all, they tend to be highly regulated um, industry and also some very well-established um, companies. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit, um, along with some FinTech, some very new modern companies. So let's talk a little bit about um, our, uh, our panelists here. Um, we're gonna start with um, Zach Steitham. So Zach is uh, from Fidelity Investments, uh, which I know fairly well. Fidelity is a, a company, a privately held company that's 76 years old. Uh, it has $11.8 trillion under um, administration. Um, and it's, I think we mentioned, I mentioned it is a privately held company. Um, he is the head of the cloud program, um, the cloud business management office, and really his goal for FinOps is to be, have it be at the forefront of thought as we adopt cloud. Next, we have Andrew Feig. He is with J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, so J.P. Morgan Chase is an interesting company. It actually has a history back to 1799. Um, which makes it probably the oldest bank in the United States currently active. Um, it is a multinational bank. It is also the largest U.S. bank and the fifth largest bank in the world, um, and it has 250,000 employees. Um, Andrew is the, uh, is the director of cloud engineering um, and in charge of their cloud center of excellence. He has been with the company for 10 years, and what he really likes to do is drive economy of scale and FinOps. Um, finally, we have Bruno Schaefer from NewBank, and NewBank is our FinTech representative here. It's nine years old, has a whole different set of um, ways that it pursues it versus these leg legacy companies. Um, it is also the largest FinTech in Latin America. It went public about a year ago, and um, Bruno has been with the company for three years. He is their engineering manager, and when he talks about um, FinOps, he talks about uh, efficiency and scale. So first of all, thank you guys all for, for joining me. So Bruno, we're gonna start with you. Um, where are each of your organizations on your um, cloud adoption journey and your FedOps journey? Yeah, so at New Bank, one thing that was different is that we, was, we were born on the cloud, so we didn't have to go through uh, the challenge of migrating from on-premise to the cloud. Um, but in terms of our FinOps adoption, I would say we are walking on most areas with more mature tooling and automation for the visibility part and a lot of optimization and major uh, opportunities on unit economics and the governance part of our FinOps. Thank you. So, Andrew, unlike NewBank, yes. you weren't born on the cloud. Clouds were just things in the sky in 1799. So, uh, <laughs> so tell us about your cloud journey. Sure, so probably about 10 years ago, the private cloud really took off, um, and we moved um, uh, you know, to that platform, uh, continued to evolve, uh, innovate there. And probably about six or seven years ago, we decided to make the decision to move to public cloud. Um, so that's still going on. Every line of business, you know, at JP Morgan is, is heavily regulated. So, you know, it could take six, 12 months to get approval to move your data to the cloud. And believe it or not, some countries around the world are not allowed to put anything in the cloud, right? So we still have to run traditional hardware in those places. So um, it's still, you know, there's still a lot more to do, but, you know, we're on our way. And um, it's, you know, it's really exciting because, you know, the, the, uh, the time we can save by going to public cloud or cloud in general, it, it, you know, six months to six days, six hours, right? It's really where, Everybody gets really excited about it. All right, Zach. Yeah, so uh, ours is a 
very similar to, to Andrew's. We, you know, we're making a big push now. So in uh, 2016, we put our first app in the cloud. 2019, we came out with our hybrid strategy, and right now we're, you know, 54% of our applications have a cloud presence, and 45% of those are cloud only at this point. So, trying to push towards 70% by 2024. So we're on our way. And Zach does push, I will say, as the head of the cloud office, uh, he pushes those migrations very hard. Um, so we saw in the state of FinOps that the FinOps usually reports to the CTO, the CIO. Um, so what I'd like each of you to do is tell the audience a little bit about your role itself and where um, are you reporting into the, um, the organization and what are your purviews? What do you consider your scope? Andrew, we're going to start with you. Sure. So interesting at JP Morgan, for a long time, cloud engineering was part of engineering architecture. Uh, in the last few years, we've broken that out, right? So that is a dedicated cloud engineering function um, that does all things cloud, right? Not only enablement of cloud, private and public, but also training, FinOps, SRE, and all that. Um, so I now report to the head, of, I'm in an employee experience uh, corporate technology division where we, we focus on the 250,000 people making sure they have great experience, developers have great experience, um, and, as well as supporting lots of uh, functions in finance, HR, uh, audit, legal. Um, and, I, so, and I report to the CIO of that group and, then, and he reports into the CIO of the firm. So the whole cloud function has been elevated way up uh, in the food chain. Great. Zach? Yeah, very similar. I report to the CIO for Enterprise Cloud Computing, one of the, we'll call it central IT organizations. Um, so we've got sponsorship from the center, but again, we talk about our model where, you know, hub and spoke, we've got representation from each of the business units. Um, and they also have, I would say, agreement or sponsorship up to their CIO. So, you know, we've got buy-in across the board, which I think is super helpful for our organization to push in to go in that direction. And then from the, just the position standpoint, you know, responsible for, I would say, our cloud P&L and just making sure we do it in the most effective and efficient manner. Great, thank you. Bruno. So uh, I, I report to the CTP business unit, which is the common technology platform. Uh, and we, we focus on building the foundation really related to infrastructure that abstract a lot of the complexity and enable the rest of the business to move fast. And CTP uh, reports to our CTO. Um, and me personally, I'm, I'm really focused on scalability and efficiency for, for the teams that I, I support. And top of mind efficiency for me right now is really cost efficiency on, on, on the cloud. So it's, that is what I get most of my, my effort this, these days. So I don't know if you guys heard my walk-up music of Zombie, um, which by the Cranberries. Um, but one of the things of why I always choose it from a FinOps perspective is we think of zombie assets all the time, and that's really important for us to get rid of zombie ac um, assets. So that's, that's the walk-up music. Um, all right, so next time, uh, Andrew, financial institutions tend to be highly regulated. Did that help or hinder getting executive support to adopted practice? I think it didn't hinder it. I think it, it, it became um, apparent very quickly, right, that moving to the cloud was going to be difficult in certain countries, right? Um, so knowing that you have to take six months, 12 months to get a regulator approved, the data to move to the cloud, you have to start that early, right? Get those approvals early. Don't wait until you're ready to go prod and say, oh, I need to get approvals. Um, so it, it, it definitely is a, is a friction point, but it, it, I think a lot of regulators around the world are also coming up to speed on cloud. I think originally it was like, no way. Um, but that's changing, right? A lot of the cloud providers are building you know, clouds in those countries where you, you have to run in those countries, right? A few years ago, it wasn't even an option. Um, so I think it will accelerate over time. The friction will be there, but I think also it's just more of the whole community evolving, everybody you know, having that learning and aha moment so that you know, I, think, I think it does become part of the normal course of business. Like anything new, anything new takes some time to, to get going. So Zach, I'm going to actually ask you the same question. How has being a highly regulated industry impacted our cloud adoption? Yeah, it's, it's very similar to, to Andrew. It's, it's not hindering us at all. It's just we've got to be thoughtful about some of the things that we do based on the contracts for companies that we service. So utilizing one cloud service provider versus another, making sure that you know, who has access to our data or who doesn't have access to our data, and just making sure that those things are top of mind as we move to the cloud. Great. So this is a, a question that wasn't in the cards, but yesterday you and I were talking about what is the difference that you have felt being a private company and then going public? Oh, the big, biggest difference was that a, a lot of things that we did um, before we turned public, when we went public, uh, 
actually turn it into problems, right? So forecasting of cloud expense, uh, it, analysts, don't, they don't like when you say, we cannot really forecast that well with a high level of confidence, so. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> so that changed the game, and, and that is one of the main reasons why we are really focusing right now on the governance part of FinOps and, and make sure we have a structured approach way to, to tackle those challenges. Great, thank you. Thank you for doing that impromptu question. Um, Zach, during the adoption, uh, Fidelity started in a hub and spoke model. Um, I know you briefly talked on that a little bit, but, but talk about why we adopted it and what your experience has been. Yeah, it's been great. It's, it's been probably an absolute highlight for us. So. The centralized practice, um, you know, as far as where I sit from the hub, you know, we're focused on those things from a purchasing strategy perspective, tool selection, making sure that we have approval forecasts and things like that. And all those requirements, when I talk about tool selection, they come from the spokes. You know, and I think about the spokes as probably the most important part since, you know, they're at the forefront of pushing or working towards cloud for their, for their business units. And they're all at a different point in their journey. You know, they're consuming cloud at different time, consuming cloud at different services, but they're all bringing it back to the center. So it ends up, you know, enhancing the, both the depth and the breadth of our FinOps knowledge on our way, and just trying to share those best practices and make sure we get the most value out of every dollar we spend in the cloud. So it's truly been a blessing to be, uh, you know, in that model and just gain, I would say, approval, or, you know, from, from across the, the, the set of CIOs that, uh, that service Fidelity. Great. Thank you. And I appreciate it, let me just say that. Um, Bruno, what have been some of the biggest financial challenges and success? And I love the story that you told last night at Black Friday. Yeah, so I, I guess internally one of the biggest challenges that we always face, and I think everyone goes through it, it's the accountability part, right? And the showback versus chargeback model. Um, that's one of the things that, that challenged us. And in terms of Black Friday, um, at New Bank, we really tackled FinOps and we focused initially on the technical aspects of FinOps. So we did a lot of work, for example, in optimizing how much spot instances we can use, right? And last Black Friday, uh, last year, was, was a time when we really sit down to build a plan, a capacity plan. So what is it that we actually need to go through Black Friday? And after we, we wrote the plan, we realized we can actually don't reserve any capacity and go full spots, right? And it, initially, everyone told us, you guys are crazy. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably not gonna work. So I'm really proud that we were able to bring all the stakeholders and have a conversation, show the plan, right? And actually show that we actually had a plan B, C, D, right? To make sure nothing uh, goes, goes wrong. And we got buying. Um, to actually go with the initial plan, let's go full spots. And we went Black Friday running 80% spots in production. Um, and it was actually a record year for New Bank in terms of sellings and uh, requests and all of that. So it, it was a really good for the company and we saved a lot of money, so really proud about that. That's fantastic. I I don't know if you saw Andrew's face when you said 80% in spot in production, he went like this, right? It's remarkable, and I think one of the, the, the really great things about that story is how thoughtful you guys were about knowing that you had this upcoming event, and by launching spot, not only did you, were you able to save the discount of, of it, but you were only um, paying that for a very short period of time, right? Really using the elasticity and scale um, of the cloud to your, your company's benefit. It's, it's a fantastic story. Um, all right, so the state of the uh, FinOps data shows that only 49% um, of companies are doing chargeback, but neither showback or chargeback represent maturity. Which way did your organization decide to go and why? Um, Andrew, we're gonna start with you, and then Zach, we're gonna go to you. Sure, so we do both, right? So the, the chargeback takes about a month to hit, and that's too late for, to do any optimization. So we try to you know, let, let everybody use the, the, the native tools in the console to see what they're actually spending. Um, and, and make it easy for them, right? Um, we actually initially blocked all those tools, don't know why. Uh, we worked hard to get them all enabled because otherwise it was a month, month, month waiting period. And once we started doing that, we, we started seeing those optimizations happening a lot quicker. Um, you can't expect somebody to do something quickly if you don't give them access to the data in real time. 
Zach? Yes, yeah, so we, do, we do both as well. And uh, I'll say going, when we started down that path um, to try to get more to, I'll call it direct allocation, anybody that came from central IT that I just said does charge back out to the business units used to hear the, well, you guys are really expensive. And, and every time it'd be like, can you guys cut your costs? And you want to be like, you're the consuming business unit. You're the ones that are driving our costs. It's not me, me coming up with this. So we made that conscious choice to go, we're actually going to put those dollars into the business unit's budget and then we'll direct the allocation back. Um, and, and I think it's worked to, to create more of a, I would say ownership from the business units where they're controlling their costs as opposed to just receiving, receiving a bill. And then on the flip side, when we talk about the showback, I think we're just not there yet. We do show back from a, I would say, down to the application or granularity perspective, see really where their costs are coming, but the direct allocation ends up being on an account perspective, um, cost center by, by account back to the business units. Great, Bruno? Yeah, uh, at New Bank, we, we did mostly show back uh, in, initially, and it worked to bring awareness to the business units and the teams, what was costing, where were they investing, but it lacked the driving accountability part, you know? Uh, it was very common for us to go to a team and say, hey, stuff is costing too much, right? And the most we could get as a response was, oh, this is pretty interesting. We would, love, we would love to do something about it, but we have a year worth of roadmap that is pointing <laughs> on the direction of new products, more customers, new features and improvements. So what we did is last year we started transitioning to a more chargeback approach. And we also are doing it via budget. So now cloud cost is part of every business unit cost. And we're seeing good results of it. Um, so we really think that the chargeback is going to help us uh, driving the accountability part, which is so important. That's great. All right. Um, I'm looking at the time, so this might be our last question. Um, we'll see. Uh, Zach, uh, what capabilities of FinOps did you feel we, you struggled the most to implement? And if there is something you could change, what would it be? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it, it's probably a little bit culture of accountability. If I, if I flip to think how we would have done it differently, you know, we were trying to go accelerate towards cloud. And, um, you know, if we were doing, I would say, the same capability at the same time, each of these business units, like I said before, are on, on a different path. I'd love to say, like, hey, we're all going to put our, you know, our web data or our web capability in the cloud first, and we're going to learn from that. If we had done, I would say, a little bit of standardized patterns, I think that would have been maybe a better way to go. And I say that just from a easier to control cost if you're doing the same platform in the same way every single time. But also, again, they're on different journeys trying to put different capabilities in the cloud, just like Bruno said, going, they've got a backlog of things. So if I could have done it different, that's probably where it would have been more standardized patterns on the way to cloud to be able to control costs up front. Great, thank you. Um, I want to thank each of you for joining our panel today and really um, for your continued contributions to the FinOps community. Um, it's really appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I want to give you also a shout out, Jen. You have been so influential in the community, and she spends uh, time with us literally every week as our chairperson working through strategy. So thank you for all your efforts. My pleasure. Yeah. Trust me. Thank you. Thanks. 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 That was a good panel. All right. 80% um, spot coverage. That's pretty amazing. So this is pretty much the end of the keynotes. Uh, most of you made it through. It looks like there's a lot more to come. So we've got a bunch of breakout sessions happening, uh, four tracks. If you're a speaker in a breakout session, uh, please hustle when we wrap here in a minute uh, over to your session. We are going to keep those fairly tight. We've got a lot of content coming. Uh, remember, there's a sponsor reception happening out here in the late afternoon, and then a big party uh, from 6.30 to 9 tonight uh, down the street. Tomorrow, networking, lightning talks, chalk talks, all kinds of things, as well as women as FinOps lunch and a bunch of other events. Check the schedule in sked, x.finops.org. Uh, one thing, two things to remind you of, very important before you go. Uh, we're going into the interactive portion where there's Q&A and there's hallway talk and there's chalk talks. Uh, very important, we've all been cooped up for a long time and you know, some of us may have forgotten our manners. We really want everybody to be, uh, probably me, uh, we want everybody to be contributing to conversations where appropriate, uh, but to be respectful of others. That's respectful of people, others' ideas. Uh, if you're a vendor, be respectful of others' products. Don't talk bad about others. Um, Definitely include uh, others in the conversation, meaning do talk, but don't talk too much, right? Leave room for others to talk. 
Um, this is the first time we've had an event where we've actually allowed salespeople to be in the history of the FinOps Foundation. So uh, for the vendors, again, I know you have booths and that's the right place to pitch your wares, but in the Q&A and the Chalk Talks, please contribute best practices, not advertisements, et cetera. Um, if anyone has an issue that they feel uncomfortable with personally, there's two contact information up on the phone. Uh, Angela is our awesome SVP of uh, events at the Linux Foundation. She's personally available if anybody needs help. Um, also a reminder, uh, we are a nonprofit, and I'm looking at the fine print down here. Please do not discuss any confidential information, especially if you're a public company. Please do not discuss any vendor pricing models that are confidential, only public information. Don't share anything that should not be shared in public. And with that, I want to go back to this to say, wow, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming and making this journey. Um, if I haven't said it enough, for this group to be successful, it's all about being a community, all about contributing. We as a staff really want to know what you want more of us or more from us in the coming year. So please find one of the staff people, tell us how we can help. Uh, and the big thing is make sure you talk to people again in the halls, ask them what their challenges are, ask them how long they've been doing FinOps, ask them where they report, whatever the things are. The best part you're going to get out of this is these hallway conversations because you're not alone in this and we really want to build the future of FinOps together. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. JR here from the FinOps Foundation. Thank you for watching. Please go to FinOps.org if you want to get plugged into this amazing community. And of course, hit subscribe right here on YouTube to get all the future content. Hope to see you soon.